I'm pleased to be able to bring up our, our speaker for today. And uh, again, many of you received his books, and I know there's been a lot of, uh, of really, really awesome stuff that's come through. And so let me uh, bring up Shane Eidelman. I came around the backside here, huh? There you go. Good to see all of you. You weren't prepared for a long men's breakfast this morning, were you? It's going to be a, uh, the, the morning is so significant, uh, especially this morning, especially with what Sean shared. It's actually, uh, I believe in God's sovereign plans, and that will tie right in. I would encourage anyone to get involved with that. And the reason discipleship is so difficult is because it takes some work, doesn't it? It's easy to sit at home, read my word, put on worship. I can kind of control that, but when I have to step out and disciple someone, that's really where the rubber meets the road, and that's why there's tremendous uh, growth when that happens. Um, I came to you this morning uh, with a heavy heart, especially for men. Anyone concerned with what's going on in our nation? Every head should be shaking. Uh, and I don't know if it's going to get better before it gets worse. You know, I've been saying for a long time that our only hope is a spiritual awakening. Our only hope is a massive spiritual awakening. And nine times out of ten, when you study spiritual awakenings, and I love that, that topic of revival, it's interesting because it's often the men who would lead the way. The prayer meetings and the, the repentance and the getting the family to church. And we've seen a real big shift now, and I'm talking about that tomorrow with Mother's Day and, and the praying mom, the power of the praying mom. But where's the power of the praying dad? You survey most kids, uh, and they'll talk about the spiritual health of their mom, and, uh, but it's, it's the men. We're kind of missing in action. And, you know, just to give you a heads up, um, I'm, I'm not here to be a, uh, a, a popular speaker or to get a lot of accolades. I'm here to challenge the heart. And that's exactly what we need today is to be convicted and stirred in our hearts. And so what I want to do uh, is, is look at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 16, 13. We can put it up on the screen. Do I get an alert too when my time's running close? Or am I good? Okay. First oh, Corinthians 16, 13 from the Amplified Bible. This is a call to men, be on guard, stand firm in your faith, which is in God, respecting his precepts and keeping your doctrine sound. Boy, there's a lot right there. Act like mature men and be encouraged or be, be courageous, be strong. And so we have the the... the the word here, why is it so difficult? I think it's so difficult because the enemy knows as the man goes, so goes the family. As we know, as the church goes, so goes the nation. And what we're seeing in our nation is, is just the, the silent pulpits and the, and the men really not taking up the rightful ground. And I think that's where the enemy comes in and attacks. And I'm not up here preaching at you. I'm preaching to all of us because I struggle with the same things. And, and, and either with men, it's usually type A personalities, too busy, too much of the things in the world, or it's lazy and slothful. And, and we, we, it's hard to find that balance of being men on fire for God, but I believe that can change in the lives of many of you. And so I want to just look at these, these calls because this is Paul, chapter 16, after he's discussed everything from remarriage and divorce and sexual sin, and, what, and just on a side note, that video, the reason confession is so powerful, um, sometimes people aren't specific exactly, but there's a confession, hey, would you pray for me, I'm struggling with lust, I'm struggling with alcoholism again, or, or opiate, or you fill in the blank, and what happens is sin loves the darkness, and sin actually grows in the darkness, and it's the light that exposes it, and the light that brings it to the surface, and then there's freedom. But without that, there, you stay shackled and bound in that addiction or that struggle because sin works in the darkness. And confession lets others know, it lets God know that we are serious about this. So the first call here, be on guard. Men, be on guard. What does a guard do? It protects. It protects something. It doesn't let something out or it doesn't let something in. And you'll see that's why there's a big call uh, recently, especially with, with church like this, our church as well, to in, in governmental offices and, and policies and procedures, we are to guard and steward God's word in all areas of life. Who told us to be quiet in the area of politics? Who, where does it say that? I, I think we're supposed to be the salt and light in all areas, from the media to, the, to, to, to Hollywood and to wherever, wherever God puts us. 
But this issue of guarding is something where we have to remember we guard ourselves first. Ever ever seen those commercials in the airplane where you're supposed to put on the mask, the oxygen mask first? Before my child? What, what, that seems a little selfish. But what's the reasoning behind that? I don't want to pass out. I want to be able to have the strength to put it on my child. And so as men, we look at that to guard something. I first must be guarded internally, spiritually. Spiritual health. And then from that foundation, you're able to guard others. You're, whether it's, it's men or to guard our marriage. And that's why it's difficult to lead in this area. You ever find it difficult to lead in the area with maybe some of you that aren't married, but when, if you're married, the spouse wants to lead and, and sometimes we just want to sit back and especially in spiritual matters. And the reason is I believe from Genesis that the woman is going to want to usurp that authority. The man is going to want to just back away. And so we're constantly fighting against that, that pull to go into lazy mode. There's no better term. Oh, let, let them handle it. I, I, I pay the bills. Isn't that enough? Uh, well, not really. Because spiritual priorities are first and foremost. But when I was looking up this word, uh, be on guard, a lot of things came up. Uh, one word was watch. And I remember somebody in the Bible said, watch and pray. Who was that? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing so this word watch, Jesus said watch, watch and pray. So it's not just praying. There's a watching and usually watching involves action. For example, when he talks about fleeing sexual immorality, you don't think about it. You don't contemplate it. You, you, you actually just turn and go a different direction. And that's watching. Watching has a, has a, a physical aspect about it. Men doing things in their home spiritually, or maybe if you're single, and you begin to build that spiritual life. So on guard, he, for, he's saying of all things to start out, be on guard. In other words, you're positioned, you're, you're guarding your family spiritually, emotionally, or yourself. You're on guard to these areas because men sometimes think that you can remain neutral. You know, I can be a, a Sunday Christian, but I'm, I'm going to work on Monday. I don't want to meet too many friends to know I get too carried away. And, and we think, oh, I can just kind of stay in this, this area. But the Bible says no man can serve two masters. He'll either love the one or hate the other. And this, this idea of guarding means we have to be solid for the Word of God. We have to be anchored in the Word of God. We've got to build our lives on the Word of God. Listen, men, the, the time of playing church is over. The time of just easy sermons is over. We've got to cut to the heart. We've got to get men regenerated and reborn and filled again with the Holy Spirit to really make a difference. Men on fire for God. And that, that begins with saying, okay, Lord, I want to be on guard. What does that involve? And then he says, stand firm in your faith. Stand firm in your faith. That has a lot to do with God's doctrine, sound doctrine. You hear that word often, sometimes we just cast it aside, but that is vitally important right now, what they call the woke culture. Have you heard of that term? Political correctness, woke, you can't offend people. Uh, we just had two major Christian authors, females come out, it's in the news this week, uh, supporting Roe v. Wade. And you've got supporting LGBTQ issues. And we can love others but still speak boldly the truth of God. And, and that's the problem. We need to get the boldness back. But yes, have the love and the gentleness and the meekness. But God has called men primarily to be bold. And you stand up for the truth and you say, not on my watch. You can't teach that garbage to a, a kindergartner at our schools. Not on my watch. I'm, I'm going to be bold. I'm going to stand firm in the faith. Sound doctrine. Proper theology, systematic theology, like Sean said, systematically going through the character and the nature of God, and you've got to bury yourself in the Word of God and seek to know what His will is and His Word. That's how you stand on sound doctrine. It's interesting. Might have a few rabbit trails here. But on this area of sound doctrine, we have to be very careful because we can take pride in our sound doctrine. And I've learned over the years, pastoring, talking to, I mean, the, the, the scenarios are endless. But so many people have sound doctrine. They're straight as a gun barrel theologically, but they're just as empty. They're missing that power of the Holy Spirit via brokenness, humility, gentleness. The fruit of the Spirit is lacking. 
And if you just have doctrine without the brokenness, without the filling of the spirit, you will hurt people. You'll go at them with an angry spirit, judgmental spirit. And, and, and this idea of doctrine has to be undergirded with brokenness and humility. Standing firm in the faith. What's, what's been very challenging for me is having five kids, all under 17. And uh, they're not watching or listening to my words as much as they're watching me. How do I handle certain situations? How do I handle unforgiveness? Do I ask for forgiveness? Do I apologize when I'm wrong? They're, they're looking at me, watching me. Oh, Dad, I hear what you're saying. And that's why we have the truth. If you, don't, if, you don't, if you don't undergird the truth with love and humility, that's where the power of the truth is. That love and humility, it, it, you'll just come across as a modern-day Pharisee. And that happened to me many years ago. Boy, I could tell everyone off. I had my John MacArthur study Bible. Boy, I could tell all those, oh, yeah, I don't know about that person. 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 Ah, I don't know. That person on TV, I don't know. That could be heretical, modalism, Pentecostalism, charismatic system. I mean, my mom said, Shane, nobody wants to be around you anymore. And early in our marriage, my wife said, man, you're just a, you, yeah, you know stuff, but... And that has to break us and humble us. A.W. Tozer said, before God uses a man mightily, he must hurt him deeply. Oh, I wish I could change course and talk about the blessing of brokenness. The blessing of brokenness. And I, there's a famous poem, I can't remember most of it, but it just came to me as well. Dad, the lessons you give, the lessons you give me may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lesson by observing what you do. For I may misunderstand you and the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. Our character speaks volumes. And I've seen it so much, it breaks my heart when, when men throw scriptures at their teenager or just nail them with the word of God. And I'm all for sharing scripture. I'm all for teaching. But if it doesn't come from the right heart, I believe that's why a lot of people walk away from the church. A lot of kids. I don't, I don't want that. And maybe some of us need to go home and, and repent and apologize. Maybe some of us need to say, hey, you know what, I've been wrong. I've done this as a pastor. As a pastor. Went to something like, hey, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have handled that that way. I understand what you're saying. Uh, just, you know, he, maybe my son talked to my wife a certain way, and I didn't know the background. And, and so seeing that, seeing how Christ has changed my life, is what they're looking at. That, that, that it's contagious. Haven't mastered it yet, amen? Like Sean said, if you knew, if you knew me, but the old chain idol, man, you would not be here. God takes a mess, therefore he gets all the glory and all the credits. Firm in the truth, but gentle with others. I'm just bold, that was my argument. I'm just bold. No, you're arrogant. Big difference. I'm just passionate about truth. No, you're a modern-day Pharisee. Men broken and humble. The greatest spiritual deterrent from growing spiritually, I believe, is pride. Puffed up, self-sufficient, self-made man. Self-acknowledgement, self-image. I'm worried about self-image. How many of us are worried about self-image? What people will think, especially the men that like to play the, 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 the kind of on the fence, who they are on Sundays, not who they are on Monday, and, and, and they don't want to post things on, you know, or share things because they don't want people to think they're too spiritual, but they go to work, they go to church. And, and so you see this, this struggle within. And it, it, it's, it's, it's I, I, I'm worried about my self-image, how I look. If men didn't care about how they looked, the altars would be full at our churches. Men would be leading the way, that, that step of repentance, that step of humility. And so do you put being right over being gentle? Do you put gifting over tenderness? And I'm just, I'm just sharing this with you guys because just, I mean, three, four, five times a week at the church where I pastor, for a decade or more, we deal with men 
and counseling and their issues. And I just confirmed with a couple of the guys that meet with some of them yesterday, we talked about it. Nine times out of ten, the man does not want to humble themselves. Doesn't want to humble themselves and say, you know, I could be wrong. How can I make this work? It's always protecting self, excuses. And that has to die. Pride has to die in you or heaven cannot live in you, Andrew Murray would say. And then one of my most important, in my opinion, one of the most important aspects of this verse, act like, not just men, I think this is the uh, English Standard Version, NIV, New King James, they, all, they, 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 they word this a little bit different, but act like mature men. Mature men, and that's why the title I had, please act like men. Please act like men. What is mature men? Well, a mature man throughout the Bible is, is guess what? He's, it's not his age. It has nothing to do with the mature man's age. Now, that helps sometimes, but it has to do with obeying God's word. Obedience. Obeying God's word. Maturity, maturity, growing spiritually is directly related to the fullness of the Spirit. As I obey God's word, as I forgive people that shouldn't be forgiven, I guess, as I, as I overcome this obstacle, as I seek God with all my heart, this, 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 the fullness of the Spirit comes upon your life because you're obeying God. And, and as you obey God and humble yourself, you empty yourself of self. And then as a result, the Holy Spirit is allowed to take over and rule and reign in your heart. And the fruit of the Spirit is evident, love, joy, peace, contentment, long-suffering, gentleness, kindness, self-control. Boy, have you ever given yourself that test? How am I doing? And this, hmm, love, joy. I mean, can I shoot you guys straight this morning? That's why I'm here. Where, where's the joy in the heart of many men for the things of God? During worship, leave here, purpose. No purpose, kind of bored, Bible's distant, God's distant, the Bible's boring. I guess I'll go to church tomorrow if I don't have anything else and my, my wife wakes me go. You don't see this in the underground churches in China and different places. But in America, where, where is that, where is the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, contentment, gentleness, where is it? Now guess what, I struggle with every one of those issues I just mentioned. Love, the Holy Spirit wants to love others, my flesh says don't you dare. I just want to be gentle. No, no, no. Be bold. Come on, Shane. Be bold. And, and, and there's a conflict within me. But the more we submit to the work of the Holy Spirit, the more we are changed from the inside out. Jesus said, if you believe on me, as the scriptures say, out of your belly is going to flow dead, stagnant water. I'll let you catch that in a minute. Let's, let's try that again. If you believe on me, as the scriptures say, out of your belly is going to flow dead water, living. It, it, actually, if you do a Greek word study, it's very interesting. It's, it's, it's like, if you believe on me, as the scriptures say, out of your innermost being is going to flow this wellspring of life, this spiritual life. So when you go to your homes, there's a spiritual life that, that, you, that you impart into your children, into your wife, because the Holy Spirit is now flowing out of you. And you're making, not that you don't struggle with depression or difficult times, but the fullness of the Spirit has, has so overcome you that, there, that I, gotta, I have to tell people about Jesus. I have to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. He he said, Jesus is going to baptize you in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't want to get too Pentecostal on you, but I want to get too conservative and dead. Have you seen both sides before? The circus? Hey, guys, sit down. I don't care how high you jump. I wonder how straight you walk when you get down. Settle down. Circus. But then this side's the cemetery. You wouldn't know the Holy Spirit of God if he came up and slapped you on the face. You're not, you're, there's no excitement. There's no passion. There's no zeal for the things of God. God that, that, the the, the Spirit-filled life is a, a vibrant life, a life full of God's Spirit. And I want to clarify that. I'm talking about the fullness of the Spirit, not weirdness. Who said you have to act weird? 
There's just a joy. There's, a, there's, a, there's an abundance that's taken place and or abundance of God's Spirit in your heart. What about, it, it's anointing, not annoyance. When the Holy Spirit is, is upon someone, there's an anointing and not annoyance. And, and you're alive, you're not dead. And I know many of you, if, if, if Calvary Chapel, many of you are from Calvary Chapel. I, I obviously listened to Pastor Chuck's his whole tape series one, t- one year when I was running heavy equipment. I just had a radio in my backhoe. And I just listened for months and just heard. And so you understand the Holy Spirit as far as in a biblical meaning. You know, there, there's alongside of us, the preposition P-A-R-A. He comes alongside. He's also in you, E-N, in you. But there's a very interesting word, epi, E-P-I. The Holy Spirit comes upon a person. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon a person, that's where lives are radically changed. Because you can have this Holy Spirit in you, but what are you doing? Quenching and grieving the Spirit. That's what he says, don't quench, don't grieve, because you won't know anything of the Spirit's power if you're quenching and grieving the Holy Spirit. There, there's, a, there's a clear mark drawn in the sand of what that is. So standing firm in maturity comes from experiencing and knowing God. And pride extinguishes the power of the Holy Spirit. Does it not? Pride extinguishes the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, there's so much pride in the church. And maybe I'm, maybe I'm, um, I have a different view because of, of, you know, when you pastor, you see a lot of things go on. But, and I was just reflecting yesterday with a couple of the guys. Do you know why at the last, I thought the last six people who have actually left our church, do you, you want to know what they told me? Two of them left because we don't believe or teach infant baptism. Okay. Uh, because I lean towards a person can, uh, I, I, my leaning is towards we are secure, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is given to us for, as a guarantee. So personally, I can't see how you can undo that work and lose this gift of salvation that God has given you. Hey, I, you want to debate it? That's fine. I've read Calvin. I've read Armenians. I, I know. But they're, and you're going to leave a church over that? Or I don't like some of the worship songs because you watched a YouTube video that, that the YouTube video is, is very hypercritical? Well, you don't believe exactly like Jack Hibbs does on the rapture. All I say about that is it could be, it could come now, but don't count on it. It, you, might be, you might go through a little hardship. There might be a little bit of tribulation coming. Don't just say, hey, don't worry. When it gets bad, we're out of here. Go tell the underground church in that in China or, or in Afghanistan. They're getting their heads cut off. I'm not going to tell my kids, hey, guys, don't worry. Just live comfortably. Don't worry. Guess what? You're going to be out of here. Don't, don't worry. Before that difficult time, could I be setting them up for failure and not success? Now, I pray for Christ's immediate return. I look forward to it. I'm ex- but you, you got to be ready for some tribulation. you got to be ready for some persecution. That's how you weather the storms of life. Could this great falling away have to do with we're not prepared? Wait a minute. I thought I was out of here before it got real tough. But why leave church over non-essentials? Why leave church over non-essentials? Pride. Could it be that God has given us disunity so we have to work together? No valid reasons whatsoever. Or we do too much worship, they say. Oh, six songs of worship. We've got 20 guys here from Westside, they know. Oh, why, why all this worship? And it's always the prideful, arrogant hearts. Just give me the word. That's all, I just want the word. No, worship changes your heart. It's self-reflection. It's self-examination. That's why you don't like it. Let's be honest. Let's be honest. Let's shoot us. I'm here to shoot you straight. I didn't come here to be your friend. I came here to, to challenge you and to also encourage you and to convict you because I know, I know me when I was drunk, laying on the couch, hungover, God had to hit me with a right hook and wake me up with the truth. Say, get off your feet. Start to be who you, I created you to be. Get up. Wipe yourself off. Repent. Get back on track. This is what our nation needs right now. We need the pulpits aflamed with righteousness, not political correctness, 
Not let's sit down, have a couch, and have a conversation. See, the pulpits used to be aflamed with righteousness. They would preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Hell was hot and heaven was sweet. They would call the people to repentance. There was a deep amount of brokenness, and the church would cry out and call out to God, Oh, God, would you rend the heavens and come down and visit your people again, that the mountains might shake in your presence, transform us by the power of your word. There was a yearning for those things. We don't see that anymore. How many of you know, don't shout it out, you're probably from Westside Christian Fellowship, you'll know, but what is the most popular, do you know the most popular sermon in America, the title of it for the last 400 years? A couple hands. Sinners in the hands of a very loving God. Sinners in the hands of an angry God. But it's actually, actually what New England needed at that time. I read Whitfield's journals and Wesley and Jonathan Edwards. And the culture is almost like ours, so be encouraged. I mean, they'll say there is no hope for our nation. There's no, there's no concept of God. Drunkenness is abounding. Prostitution is growing. They felt hopeless until God honored that cry and that call for repentance. It sparked that first great awakening. You can look in Duncan Campbell in the 1940s and 50s in Welsh, in the Welsh revivals, or Evan Roberts in Welsh, in the Scotland revivals, and there's been so many, and, and they, those are propelled by men and women praying and fasting and seeking the heart of God. The difficult things, the difficult things. We need to hear the hard truth, that to wake us up. As long as it's coming from, from the power of the Holy Spirit and in love, it's okay to say, he, Sean just quoted, the word of God inspired for reproof. That's not a popular term. To reproof someone for correction, for admonishment, instruction. Th those are terms that, because God is trying to bring out of us what he's already put inside of us. And sometimes we need to be rocked to our core. Many times, you know, marriages aren't restored until the wife says, I'm gone, I'm leaving. And then they finally wake up or until somebody shoots them straight about their lifestyle. But right now we just want to coddle and comfort so much. And I get in trouble for saying this. People have told me not to say it, but I'm going to say it. Is this recorded? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's okay because you know my heart. And I get, sometimes I get going about our nation, the condition of our nation. And I do say it, and I believe it, Joel Olstein's sermons are not going to cut it in these dire times. We have enough, we have enough of the, just the watered down, go get them encouragement, which we need to be encouraged. We need to be uplifted. But where is the prophetic voices again? Where are the Isaiahs and the Jeremiahs calling the nation back? Where is the Ezekiel who spent so time with God, much God, time with God, he spoke boldly. Where is the Elijahs and the Elijahs, the king even said, oh, Elijah, you owe troubler of Israel. Where are the troublers of America that will call out sin and call the nation to repentance? Where where are those prophetic voices? That's how you turn a nation around. You don't coddle and comfort sin. You call it out. That's how the change comes. <laughs> Pride extinguishes the power of the Spirit. We say, I don't need more of God. I'm good. I've been a Christian all of my life. I read my Bible every day. But do you need to humble yourself? Listen, I'm, I'm not coming here like I said that I, I've arrived. I'm telling all of us how to get there. Those from my church know I've shared before, but I came from a really hard environment. My dad came from the farms of Oklahoma. Uh, heavy equipment, operating, construction, if you know, that's brutal work. She had my share of digging bars and all kinds of things. And, you know, I get hurt. My dad would say, boy, you don't cry. You don't cry. You don't show emotion. He was one, he was, he was all, all, all state, I believe, in, in, at high school in football. And people would ask him, how do you do? He goes, you just get as mad as, I won't use the explicit, but you just get as angry as, and you go and you tear it through. And that was, I was raised in that environment. Raising my hands during worship? Mm-mm. Steroid abuse, tons of testosterone, Diana Ball pills, growth hormones, searching for fulfillment, obviously turned to alcohol at a young age, 
addicted to alcohol, steroid abuse, crystal meth, all in one night. I don't know how I'm still here. And so this isn't coming from an angry heart, guys. It's coming from a heart. If it was not for the grace of God, I wouldn't be here. It's grace that's brought me here thus far. It'll be grace that takes me home. I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was once blind, but now I see. And, and once you receive the fullness of the Spirit and you're excited about God's Word and you see lives radically change and you see that we can make a difference, you get excited, you get passionate, you call others to that area of surrender. Doesn't, have to do with, doesn't all this have to do with surrender? Surrender to the one true and living God. I don't care who sees my posts on social media. I don't care if people see me praising God at work. I don't care if they see this guy up at the altar raising holy hands and saying, Lord Jesus Christ, I bow my knee to you this morning. I surrender everything to you. I'm not going to try to live on either side of the fence. You are my Lord. You are my Savior. Come hell or high water, I will surrender my life. And God honors that. Again, I didn't come to be your friend. I, kept, I came to help restore and revive and to break. What I've noticed about, you know, when I travel and I speak, I was actually just in Dallas a month ago or so, and then a different part of Texas, but <laughs> these kind of messages, I've been doing this so long, I know, it, it, you'll get two responses. Brother, thank God, I need to hear that with weeping and tears and marriages restored, or the other guys, who is that guy? They just head for the door, I'm out of here. Many, many of you know there's a big conference center up by uh, Sequoias on the other side, I don't want to say the name. But I spoke my heart out like this at a men's conference. And they said, we have to take you off the list, it's just, it's too heavy. And I want to say, don't, that's the problem, sir. That's the problem. We want to coddle and not confront. We want to be encouraged but never repent. Please tickle my ears. Don't challenge my heart. Timothy, for the time will come when they will not endure. They will not put up with sound doctrine. But they will look for teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. I'm, I'm always amazed. I'll meet somebody who doesn't know the Lord. They don't know the Lord. They say, but I, I, you know, I really like that person on TV. I'm like, what? No conviction. No challenging. Encouraging. And we have to get back to that. The word of, is it not convicting? Can you, can you please demonstrate a prophet in the Old Testament who wasn't convicting? Do you know the whole role of the prophetic voice? Do you know why God raised up prophets? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Zechariah, Haggai, Malik. Why did he raise up those voices to soothe and to comfort? He said, I'm going to raise, Isaiah, Jeremiah, I called you before you were even born. I called you in your mother's womb to be a voice to my nation, to pluck out and to pull down, to root out Isaiah. Call the nation back. There's a yearning. There's a desire. There's, there's challenging the people because my default is to not to challenge you. My default is like, okay, how can I get these guys worked up? I used to be a motivational speaker. This should be easy. Everybody will like me. But how many people will leave unchanged and unchallenged? Something that today still, when it, when it really struck me 15 years ago, I, I put down my Bible and almost wept. Did you know, we hear the term false prophet a lot, correct? Did you know what the, really the number one characteristic of a false prophet was in the Old Testament? To say God says this and God says, I didn't say that. Jeremiah 23, I have not called these prophets, but they ran. I have not spoken to them, but they spoke. Yet had they truly stood in the counsel of my word, they would have turned this entire nation back to me. Is not my word like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? Is not my word like a fire that devours? But they have perverted the words of the living God. How? By not warning 
and instructing and challenging. How is that? That's a, that's a prophetic, and you have many prophetic, false prophetic voices today. Oh, no, God, God just, it's all about love. He doesn't care about a lot of these issues. Man, just go and leave here. You can be openly engaging in sin and involved in churches, and they don't even care anymore. It's more of a social club. That's why the power of God is not there. The power of God rests upon a church that is broken and humble before him. That's where true change takes place. You can still know the Bible, but lack God's presence. Pride, pride, men, don't you see pride is destroying us. For every Mike Tyson, there's a Buster Douglas. I'm dating myself, but anybody remember that fight? Odds were like 42 to 1, no problem. And boy, though, that got shifted. The story about Muhammad Ali on an airplane, didn't wear a seatbelt. Stewardess comes by, Mr. Ali, would you please put your seatbelt on? Superman don't need no seatbelt. She said, Superman don't need no airplane. <laughs> Pride is deadly. Pride is damning. God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, he will reap. And I was reminded too, just as I was speaking on Jeremiah 23, the end of 2 Chronicles, right before Israel, or actually in Israel's final destruction, God, sent, God said, I sent my messengers I sent my messengers to them, rising them up early and sending them to my people. Why? Because I had compassion on my people and on my dwelling place. But they mocked my messengers, they despised my word, and they scoffed at the prophets until the anger of the Lord arose against his own people. And what do you do when God says you want it? You got it. You know what really doesn't impress me right now is full churches. Praise God for that. We grew like this church grew and, and other churches grew. What impresses me is, is men broken and humble on the altar, crying out to God, leading the prayer meetings, leading in this area of spiritual health. It's difficult. It's challenging. I know. Second Kings, I'll be ending up here shortly. Second Kings, Josiah. Many of you know the story, um, I believe it was Manasseh, wicked, wicked Manasseh. God says, because of Manasseh, I'm going to judge Israel. And then here comes Manasseh's son, more wickedness. And then for some reason, Josiah is born. And what they did is they found the word of God in the temple. And they came and they brought the word of God to Josiah. And he actually, when he read, I mean, that, shouldn't that just... What, what, with, with the Roe v. Wade or the LGBTQ agenda or transgenderism or the perversion or the porn that is so perverted, shouldn't that cause us to not physically tear our clothing but spiritually break us like Josiah? And he, when he read the word of God, when he said, woe be to those who call evil and evil good. Woe be to that nation who discards innocent life. Woe be to those, those people who, who lay their children on the searing arms of Molech. Woe be to that nation. Josiah cried out. He, he says he told his clothes and he cried out to God and God says because your heart was tender because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before the Lord and you tore your clothes and you wept before me I have heard your prayer and God actually stayed his hand of judgment on the nation there's God's sovereign will, there's his perfect will, permissive will. I, I, let the theologians debate that. All I know is that you can intercede on behalf of a nation, on behalf of your family, on behalf of a family member, a friend. You can intercede. And somehow within the sovereign plan of God, he might give us a measure of revi revival in our bondage. What about in Ezekiel's day? The prophets were corrupt. The priests were corrupt. The politicians were corrupt. And God said, but I looked, I looked from among them. I sought for a man from among them who would build a wall and stand in the gap before me that I might not destroy the land. But I found no one. Now, is that just, God just decided to put that in there for a reason, I mean, for no reason at all? What does it mean to stand in the gap? And to be an intercessor, I mean, in my opinion, God's been a, it's a continual transforming process for me. Um, 
but it, it, it's a heart to say, Lord, I want to serve you. I fully surrender my life. Uh, even, though, even though I don't like, you know, what people think of me, I'm going to crush that. I'll be the first one to this altar. Man, I tell people at our church, I'm the first one at this altar. I need Christ as much on this side of the cross as I do on that side of the cross. Lord, I'm, I, I want to repent of my sin. I want to pray and fast and seek the heart of God. I want to get serious about spiritual matters. I don't care who is watching or who is listening. I'm going to stand up for King Jesus. Holy Spirit, would you please fill me and change me from the inside out. Standing in the gap. It's been said that cowards die many times before their deaths. And so the verse, one of the passages, or one of the uh, words there is be brave. Be brave. What is brave? It's inner confidence. Inner confidence and strength and it's fortitude. And then it goes on, be strong. What, isn't that the same? No, being brave is inner confidence. Strong is the outward reflection on that. So you, many people are, are pretty confident inside. But you won't see them do much on the outside. When was the last time some of you were, especially if you're retired, you have more time at, the, at a school board meeting, challenging the outright lunacy of some of these school districts? Or writing, you know, you can write editorials in your paper and saying, and, and saying no, this is not right. See, we've been oppressed so long. And not wanting to, to, to speak the truth in love because it might offend. Let me just drop a bombshell right now. The truth will offend. Get over it. The truth of God will offend. It cuts like a, light, a, a knife. It hits like a hammer. It devours like a fire. But here's the key. The truth offends, but my attitude shouldn't. See the difference? There, there's, there's a love for the person you're talking to. And being strong, this definition is spiritually strong, not physically strong. It's humility over haughtiness, it's wisdom over wealth, and it's a worshiper before a worker. Oh, if I could just get my usher team, 40-some ushers and, and, and 30 ushers, that many of them are not at the, at, at the altar, they're not leading the way, or the uh, uh, different men, that they, they want to be workers. They want to be workers, but God wants a worshiper first. I want to see my, my kids see me as a worshiper, worshiping God on fire for God. And then out of that outflow, you become a worker. But we see so many times we want to admit, we want to do things, we want to work, we want to work. And I see it all the time. So how many people, we ask, oh yeah, I'll, I'll usher, I'll do something, I'll do the work, but I don't want to be in the worship service. There's, that's a disconnect there. So, in closing, I'm going to go back to this verse from Jesus. Watch, watch with humility. Watch with humility and pray fervently. Matthew 6, 6, many of you know it in the Amplified Version. When you pray, this is why I love talking about prayer. I write on prayer. I, I mean, I, my... My prayer life is nowhere where I'd like it to be, and that's a good thing, man. Be discouraged. Be, I mean, I want more because it drives you deeper. If I ever say, you know what, my prayer life is great, I'm good. We've got a problem on our hands. There, there should be a drawing. There should be a, a oh, I want more of God and more of God. There's a hunger. This hur hunger will never be satisfied. This hunger for God is never satisfied. But if you drink of this water, you will never thirst again. But Jesus tells us here, he says, when you pray... When you pray, go into your most private room and shut your door, and God will meet you there openly. I mean, is it possible? Listen, in the Old Testament, they would call him El Shaddai, Elohim, Yahweh. But Jesus now changes that. He says, you go boldly in, and you say, Father, Father, hear my cry. And I, th I thought just a few weeks ago, is there a place where God will actually meet with me? Is there a place where God will say, I'm here, son. Cry out to me for your marriage. Cry out to me for your children. Cry out to me for your nation. Because and I hear the voice of my crying children. And like a physical father runs to that and begins to build and rebuild and shape and restore. Is there a place that God meets with us? Yes, shut the door. And we are to be shut out with man and shut in with Christ. It's interesting, the disciples didn't say, teach us form. 
teach us a form. I think we have enough form. A form of godliness. A form of Christianity. A form of prayer. They teach us to pray. We want to, be, we want to feel the power of the Spirit. And I said, I'm talking tomorrow about the power of the praying mom, but I would love to talk sometime about the power of the praying dad. Guys, the reason our families are in chaos and the nation is out of control, men have largely forsaken their God-given role as spiritual leaders in the home. If that hurts, good. Because when something hurts, we go home and we think about it. I've talked to enough men to know that they don't, like what I, they don't like what I say usually because they need to hear what I say. If you don't like what I'm saying, it's probably because you need to hear what I'm saying. All of it is thoroughly biblical. Examine it yourself. And there's a cry I, I, I want, a, a, there's a desperation. Men, you've got to be desperate. You can't just, it's not just lukewarm, normal Christianity. This is a call of desperation when the woman just reached out and touched the hem of his garment. When the prophets would rip their clothes and cry out, oh God, rend the heavens. There's a desperate call and our call today should be, God, fill me or kill me. Fill me with the Spirit of God. I want, I, want, I want all of Christ. I won't get to perfection on this side of heaven, but I want to be filled mightily with the Holy Spirit. I want to be gentle to my children, gentle to my spouse. I want to have that, that, that power of the Holy Spirit resting upon my life. And it's been said, a man cannot lead others where he himself is not willing to go. And of course... I want to mention this. A true man has a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. William Grinnell, famous, famous Puritan, he said, He who will not take God before he dies, the devil will take him soon after he dies. And always a group this size. I, I don't know where everyone's at spiritually. I grew up in the church. Anyone been there? Owned a Bible. Went to Christian school. I live in America. Isn't that Christian America. Religion, not relationship. Going through the motions, but not having a relationship. No passion for God, no passion for the thing. I hated the Bible, but I loved my drugs. I hated worship music. Oh my goodness, I'd make fun of you guys. What is this? But I could get drunk and listen to ACDC and drive 100 miles an hour on the freeway. That's cool. That's manly. Give me a break. We're dying inside spiritually. You need a clear direction of what a real man is. So you need to ask that question this morning, some of you. Am I truly heaven bound? Am I truly heaven bound? Because heaven born is heaven bound. And it's very simple. The simple gospel. So simple. Even a child knows it. If you humble yourself, oh, isn't that interesting? Humility is a vitally important. Humble yourself. Humble yourself and say, God, I need you. I repent of my sin. I repent. I need the cross. I need the cross of redemption. I can't save myself. I'm not good enough. Lord, would you please save me? And I can tell you, God is my witness. It was so profound in my life. I don't know if I was actually not saved or, or just filled with the Holy Spirit. A lot of people, Christians, have struggled with that over the years because I was dead, now I'm alive, now the word of God comes alive, and there's a passion, there's a desire, and, and, I, and I just feel for those people who go through the motions, and we do think going to church, hey, that's, I'm good with God, and we're not good with God, unless we have that vital relationship. So the call this morning, I'm going to have uh, the worship leader come on up and, and just, I think we're going to close with the song or so, but I want to give the opportunity, and like I told you before, I'll... I'll lead the way if we have to. I want to give you the opportunity to just come forward. You can kneel, you can stand. There's nothing magical about that. But what it is, to me, it's a step of humility. It's saying, Lord, I do need you. I don't care who, who, who's here. I don't care what, what, what people think. I'm going to come to this altar and I'm going to acknowledge you. Maybe for the first time, but also, anybody need more of God? Anybody need to be filled with the Spirit of God and repent of, of um, besetting sin and arrogance? And that's what that step for. It's a step of humility saying, Lord, I do need more of you.
because the, 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 the uh, what is it, 100 mile journey begins with the first step. And so if God is, is kind of working in your heart and you need to take that step of humility, we're just gonna, we're just gonna camp out here for a song and, and, just, and just maybe bring your petition to God. Are you, are you struggling with your marriage? Maybe you're older, your kids are gone and you're distant to God. You have no purpose, no passion anymore. How can we sit in the church of the living God and not be passionate? It's a living God, a vibrant God, above all other gods. There's no other gods but King Jesus. There should be an excitement and a joy that comes from our, from our hearts. His word is like a fire burning in my heart. And I know it's just, it's just, it's just a step, a step in the right direction. And, and, and pastoring, that's one thing that, that breaks my heart is, is so many people, and, and you know, I mean, they're, they're broken. Marriages are being destroyed. Kids are being perverted. Addictions are taking people down. And I'm always offering, I can't do it for them, but I'm always offering, listen, drink of this cup and you will never thirst again. Drink of this living water of Christ and you will never thirst again. I've got the answer. His name is Christ and you fully surrender your life. Would you come and drink, drink freely from the fountain of living water? Living water just steps away. Just, I can almost feel it. I can feel it, but there's pride. Pride, I don't need that. And pride prevents a mighty filling of God's spirit.